Greetings. The words conspiracy theory have a particular interest to myself. It seems that the words have little significance themselves, yet the impression that they place on a person's mind is the real impact. For if you mention conspiracy theory, many individuals will conjure up an image of what they believe a conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist look like and usually it is a negative one. However, if you ask the same people what does conspiracy theory mean, you may get varying answers which may or may not be the definition you'll find in a standard dictionary. From the Oxford Dictionary, there are several words related to this topic. One is conspiracy, a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. First, Second, the action of plotting or conspiring. Take note that the first definition contains the word group. Does it necessarily have to be a group? Conspiracy theory, a belief that some covert but influential organization is responsible for an unexplained event. Hmm. Seems like a lot of criteria to me. So the organization must be covert, influential, responsible, and the event must be unexplained. Hmm. A conspiracist is a person who supports a conspiracy theory. So a conspiracist is not necessarily somebody who conspires. A conspirator is a person who takes part in a conspiracy. Difference. Conspiracist, person who supports conspiracy theory. Conspirator person who takes part in a conspiracy. Hmm. Now let's take a listen to what the counter narrative is. Let's start with you. Let's be clear about what we mean by a conspiracy theory. I assume we're not just talking about people saying, I saw Elvis at the 7-Eleven. That may not be true, you know, or big, but it's not really rising to the level of what we're talking about. What exactly do we mean? So oftentimes a lot of different ideas get thrown into the conspiracy theory bucket. Ideas like aliens, Elvis coming back to life, Paul is dead, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot. So those things aren't necessarily conspiracy theories unless there's some dark shadowy force that's uh, trying to hide the truth from, from the American public for some sort of nefarious reason. Normally what we mean when we say conspiracy theory is an accusation that may or may not be true that points to a group of people who are working in secret against the common good and for their own benefit. And this usually involves attempting to change our baseline institutions in some way. So some sort of act that wouldn't be a regular crime, uh, but that would go beyond... Um, what our normal criminal statutes are up to get. So normally, we, you know, you would arrest somebody for, you know, holding up the 7-Eleven, 
But that wouldn't be so much of a conspiracy just because they planned it. So when we say conspiracy theory, we're not talking so much about, you know, criminal conspiracy. Whereas in a conspiracy theory, you know, attempting to brainwash our nation's youth with rock music. Right. I mean, that's that wouldn't be illegal in any way, but it would be a conspiracy theory. So really the focus is not just on what the theory is, but on the conspiracy, this idea of something subversive. Yes, it's big, it's subversive, and 99% of the time it conflicts with authoritative knowledge. What we know is that most Americans believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Um, the numbers have been... Uh, anywhere from 50% in some studies to, uh, during the 90s, about 90% of Americans thought that there was um, an alternate story to the JFK assassination that was not being told. You know, conspiracies are deeply embedded in the nation's history, and so are panics over conspiracy theories and what they do and what they do to the discourse and what they do to democracy. When you say most Americans believe conspiracy theories, what, are, what do you find the ones that are most prevalent today that maybe most Americans might at least somewhat give give a, a credence to, give a look to? Uh, the JFK assassination uh, is a really common one. Another one would be that the government is hiding what they know about aliens. That's very common. Um, there is a not inconsiderable group of people who believe that vaccines cause autism and that the CDC, is the Centers for Disease Control, is covering that up. Um, there are also, you know, not a small number of people who might believe that the moon landing was staged, although that one is a little bit uh, antiquated at this point. That, that these theorists are not just kind of considered a fringe, lunatic element, but that we have to deal with them. The thing that's, that people are objecting to so much is that it seems to give him a platform for, for telling those lies. And so there's a fine line, you know, are you giving someone a platform or are you investigating that person? But this is all, Joshua, I think part of the, uh, I guess it, it falls loosely under the rubric of fake news. Long ago here in Washington, D.C., literally up the road from where I'm speaking right now is a pizza parlor where a man walked in with a rifle because he thought that Hillary Clinton had a secret cabal of child pornography and there were kids who were locked in the basement at this pizza restaurant. It seems outlandish, but is that really an outlier? How often do these conspiracy theories blow up into violence? Well, political violence is very rare in this country, and that's a good thing. And when we do polling on it, what we find is that the vast, vast majority of Americans do not endorse political violence. So that's good. So what that leaves us with are a small handful of incidences that pop up every few months that make the news um, that are driven by you know, political reasons. And oftentimes what we find is that some of the perpetrators do believe in conspiracy theories and sometimes that they're driven specifically by their conspiracy theories. In the case yesterday with the baseball shooter, it looks like this person had, um, um, had taken a healthy dose of Trump-Russia conspiracy theories. If you go back um, a little ways, you find that the person who shot up the Planned Parenthood um, believed that the government was trying to break into his brain, so he installed a metal roof on his hut and encouraged his neighbors to do the same. If you go back to the Boston Marathon bombers, um, they believed that 9-11 was a hoax. So you do find that, you know, some violence is perpetrated by conspiracy theorists. There are just some people in our society who are nuts, and they're going to be susceptible to this kind of foolishness, and they're the ones who are going to take matters in their own hands. Violence is on everyone's mind. It's something that we think about a lot against Sharia. Sharia law, Islamic law, is creeping across the United States and preparing to enslave us all right. to so, talk about Muslims and immigrants. So before we hit a break briefly, it sounds like the more common denominator is not insanity, it's, it's anger. Yes. Liz in Virginia emails, my fourth grader and her classmates talk about the Illuminati on a regular basis. Some weird occurrence equals Illuminati confirmed. It's baffling. Crazy. They're just lunatics. So this starts early. Why do you think conspiracy theories are so attractive? Professor Yuzinski? Well, they're attractive to some people and not to others, and uh, there is a neat Illuminati thing going on on the internet that 
kids of all ages get into. Even my college students seem to like it. They think that Kanye and some other um, rap artists are into um, are in the Illuminati. And my guess is that that this Kanye person, West in the Illuminati. Yeah. So okay. um, it does not shock me that somebody has a daughter who. Who, who, you know, puts out memes that say, oh my God, Illuminati confirmed. That doesn't suggest the person, that, that the child is a hardcore conspiracy theorist. Um, it's just sort of, that instance is, seems to me to be more of a cultural phen phenomenon. Um, but with that said, for most people, uh, some people are attracted to conspiracy theories, other people are not. Um, and in order for anyone to buy into any particular conspiracy theory, that conspiracy theory has to match all of their other dispositions. So Republicans aren't going to believe that um, George Bush blew up the Twin Towers, and Democrats aren't going to believe that President Obama faked his birth certificate, and Catholics aren't going to believe in Da Vinci Code theories, you know, the theories that suggest that Jesus had children, and those children became the kings of France. So... You know, people reject a lot of conspiracy theories. There are millions out there. Most of us don't believe in, in the vast, vast majority, but most of us believe in at least one. Well, everyone believes in at least one. Really, more people believe in a few. Um, we don't always even know it, that we believe in them. Um, but there is an attractiveness there for those who think the world works in those terms. Particularly in the 50s through the 70s, Americans discovered a number of things about, you know, CIA experiments like MK Ultra that I think did a lot to damage public trust even today. Um, I also think that in a system where you do not necessarily feel represented by your government, there is a greater chance that you are going to buy into conspiratorial beliefs. We see that in the United States and we see that in other places. That if you feel disenfranchised within a system, you are more likely to come up with theories about um, the nefarious forces behind it. But for journalists like you and me, we do have to be careful how we talk about this because it can very easily feel like the press is the cabal. Right. We have to be very careful about uh, overstating the case. So uh, we are living in a in a society right now in which uh, truth is uh, under siege. I think we could say. And uh, but there is such a thing as established fact, and we need to. We need to uh, stick close to that so that we aren't fanning the fires of conspiracy theories or, or sort of that post-truth thinking that we've talked about. But right now, anonymously sourced stories are how we're getting at a lot of the truth that's happening within the government. And it's unfortunate. We would love to be able to have every story attributed to a named source. That would be the ideal. But if we did that, we would have very few news stories. So there is an element of saying to the reader or the listener or the viewer, please trust us because we're going to give it to you straight and we've verified and we've checked and we've corroborated these sources. Websites like 4chan, the number 4-C-H-A-N, 4chan, and Reddit breed memes that, while often distasteful, are meant to be funny. I think a lot of what you see online does come from radical conspiracy theorists, but it turns into a sort of joke. Anna, could you talk about some of these websites, these fora, where these conspiracy theories and goofy memes proliferate? It's really hard to tell what is in earnest and what is a joke. Uh, and that is on purpose. Uh, when a, you know, a joke or a meme or a, a hoax is taken seriously by the mainstream media, they really enjoy it. Um, it's, it's a goal. Now, there's a website called Vote, um, and the Pizzagate forum there is uh, very lively, and it has allowed Pizzagate to sort of stay alive and continue changing form. Here is one clip of the interview between NBC's Megyn Kelly and Alex Jones of InfoWars. Listen. Now, 9-11 was an inside job. When I say inside job, it means criminal elements in our government working with Saudi Arabia and others wanted to frame Iraq for it. Just a fact. Sandy Hook. Well, Sandy Hook's complex because I've had debates where we've devil's advocates said the whole story is true, and then I've had debates where I've said uh, that n none of it's true. When you say parents faked their children's death, People get very angry. Yeah, well, that's all I know. But they don't get angry about the half million dead Iraqis from the sanctions, or they don't get angry about all the that's illegal wars. That's a dodge. No, no, it's not a dodge. The media never covers all the evil wars it's promoted. All the that big doesn't things. excuse what you did and said uh, about Newtown. Uh, uh, you know okay. it. I, here, here's the difference. 
I looked at all the angles of Newtown, and I made my statements long before the media even picked up on it. That's Alex Jones speaking to Megyn Kelly in an interview that will air this Sunday night. Is Alex Jones's dream come true? I cannot overstate how exciting this must be for him because Alex Jones's message from the 90s on his radio show through today has been that he is a dangerous force for truth and that the global elites don't want him talking and that they're trying to silence him. So the fact that there is so much controversy and debate is an incredible PR boon to him and it really, you know, creates a situation where he can say, you know, look, see, I'm I'm too dangerous. I am too much of a truth teller. You said Alex Jones has been on radio since the nineties. He's not just someone yeah. who popped up since YouTube went on the air. He's been around for decades. Yeah, absolutely. People in Austin where he lives would tell you, you know, that um, in the 90s he was he was sort of a, you know, a local character. He appears in two Richard Linklater movies um, as sort of a street preacher character. Um, and it's important to note, too, that his ideas uh, where he, he routinely claims that every mass casualty event in the United States is a false flag, uh, you know, was planned or orchestrated by the government. It's important to note that that didn't even happen uh, for the first time with September 11th. He made that claim about the Oklahoma City bombings in 1995. So Alex Jones it has been a fixture for a long time. He's been making these claims for a long time. And, you know, the fact that we all know who he is now is, as you mentioned, because Donald Trump cites him and talks to him and went on his show. So actually, arguably, there is more justification now to interview Alex Jones and to, you know, submit him to an inquiry about what he believes and the claims that he makes than ever before. There is more justification now to interview Alex Jones and to, you know, submit him to an inquiry about what he believes and the claims that he makes than ever before. I would just question if Megyn Kelly is the person to do it. Now, Alex Jones put up a video online saying that he thinks some of the elements of the aftermath of Sandy Hook were faked. The outcry picked up. He put up a video this week clarifying his position on Sandy Hook further and then calling for NBC to pull the interview because his comments have been warped. Here's a piece of what that video said in terms of the backlash. Why are they attacking InfoWars? Why are they so desperate? Why are they coming after us? Because they're scared of the fact that we're the leading independent media, that they understand the paradigms, that the operating systems of the American reboot that was thrown out of public were basically re-engineered by InfoWars. That's Alex Jones in a video on his website this week. Margaret Sullivan, what do you think we should be doing about Alex Jones? Well, one interesting fact about Alex Jones is that he has tremendous number a tremendous number of followers the infowars website alone got 500 million views last year so uh, he has a very rabid and a very devoted following and we have to know that there certainly is a financial element here and you know i think it takes a very skilled and a very um, you know a real so solid serious journalist to be able to break down the kind of rhetoric that he's so skillfully able to throw out there. And that's what really worries me about this. If you interview Alex Jones, Margaret, what would you ask him? You know, I don't think it's a question of what you ask. I think it's a question of getting beneath his answers and pushing back hard, presenting facts that are, that are you know, unable to be refuted. You know, any question, because I will ask him. What would you ask him? I will, for one thing, I would ask him editorially when you decide what you want to talk about. What are your limits? What are the lines you will not cross? I would like to ask him, what do you know for sure? Who do you trust? And where do you feel safe? I would like to know what he believes in. Not just what he doesn't believe in. And that's my concern with his men telling you. Megan's not stupid, but she may not be savvy. At least not savvy enough to actually make the interview more light than, than heat. But Emerald, before we get a break, I wonder what you think in terms of strategy for Alex Jones to be. What is the way to get some, some value out of that conversation? Or do we just need to look at the Alex Joneses of the world and just marginalize them? Jones Health Supplement line when we come back after the break. Now to our conversation about conspiracy theories with Gizmodo senior reporter Anna Merlin, UN political science professor Joseph Uzinski, and Washington Post media columnist Margaret Sullivan. So Anna Merlin, health products? Pick that up. Does Alex 
Jones actually believe his theories, or does he have an agenda that is aided by convincing people to follow his causes? Anna, what do you think? So, that's a conspiracy about Alex Jones, right? That he doesn't really believe it and that he has an agenda. There we go. Now we're really um, down the rabbit hole. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter. There's no way to know. But what we can say is this, with Donald Trump, his conspiracy theories are probably strategic. Even though we would look at any particular one and say, why is he saying that Ted Cruz's dad killed JFK? You know, what does he have to gain from that? But there was a strategy there. And if you boil all of his conspiracy theories down to one thing, it's that, it's that political elites had sold out regular Americans' interests to foreigners. What do you make of this whole talk about the deep state and destabilizing the administrative state? Is that a conspiracy theory or is that just kind of a larger version of kind of a conservative political line that says we need smaller government? I mean, I don't think it rises to the level of a conspiracy theory, but it is something that it's a, it's, you know, is it a conspiracy theory? I guess it does sort of verge fairly close to it. The UK is more concerned about elites than it is about government. We're here, where Americans are particularly concerned about government, particularly when the government is run by people we don't like. And part of the reason for that is it's written into our political DNA. I mean, the Constitution is itself a conspiracy theory. I mean, the Constitution is itself a conspiracy theory. You know, why do we have separation of powers? It's not so the three branches can get together and hug it out. It's that we assume that at least one of the branches are going to try to do something terrible. They're trying to be tyrannical. And we need those other two branches to stop them. And as long as all three branches are fighting each other, that will keep any one branch from being able to uh, instill a tyranny. And even further down, you know, when we talk about, like we've been talking a lot about impeachment lately, whether the president and his alleged actions is impeachable, even that is separated within that branch of power. Congress, you know, the, the power to remove a president is divided. The House has the power to impeach and the Senate has the power to, to remove. And by the way, just to clarify the quote, it's rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God, just to get it specific. Let me get to another conspiracy theory that's been kicking around Washington lately, and it has to do with Seth Rich. Uh, Anna, can you run us briefly through the Seth Rich conspiracy theory? What did that involve? Yeah, um, a young DNC staffer named Seth Rich, he was 27, was shot and killed uh, in Washington, D.C. on July 10th, 2016, um, walking home from a bar. He was on the phone with his girlfriend at the time. Uh, and within 36 hours, crazy. the conspiracy theory started. They're just lunatics. Um, the earliest version was that uh, Rich had been a disaffected DNC staffer and was on his way to testify against Hillary Clinton to issue a statement to the FBI. Um, and the Rich conspiracy has changed, changed forms a number of times since then, but uh, it, it has always centered around the idea that Seth Rich was killed by global elites for trying to bring the truth about Hillary Clinton or the DNC to light. And I should add, before we go any further, that I've spoken to the Rich family and these theories torment them. They have made their lives hell. One of the people who has been very, who had been very active in reporting on this, or at least talking about this, this is Fox News host Sean Hannity. Rich's family had urged Mr. Hannity to stop harping on this story. Here's part of how Mr. Hannity responded on his program. To you, my loyal audience, which is very important, please do not interpret what I'm saying tonight to mean anything. Don't read into this. I promise you I am not going to stop doing my job. To the extent of my ability, I am not going to stop trying to find the truth. That's what we do here every single day. That effort is not stopping in any way, shape, matter, or form. I am continuing the work that I promise to do every day for you, and at the proper time, we shall continue and talk a lot more. That was Fox News host Sean Hannity. Now, lest you think that this is just isolated to Fox News, Texas Congressman Blake Farenthold spoke to John Berman and Poppy Harlow on CNN at the height of the Seth Rich conspiracy. 
intrusion at the DNC server was an insider job or whether or not it was the Russians. Yeah, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now that's CNN's John Berman and Poppy Harlow speaking to Texas Congressman Blake Farenthold. Margaret, I wonder if to this, to this point you would answer Ryan's question by email. Ryan wrote, what about the dismissive nature of labeling a belief a conspiracy theory? Isn't it advantageous in some cases for an entity seeking to cover up or hide something to have it become culturally labeled? as a conspiracy theory? Well, we definitely have to be attuned to what evidence is there. Uh, in this case, the Washington, D.C. police who investigated this uh, murder uh, have said that there's no evidence uh, to support this idea that the DNC was involved or that Hillary Clinton was involved. Um, you know, we have to stay as close as we can to establish truth. And while your listener is correct that we don't want to be dismissive and we want to consider all possibilities, once we have found out as clearly as we can that there's nothing there, we ought to be able to communicate that and have it be accepted. And, you know, it's really a form of entertainment, much more so than a form of news coverage or journalism. So then let's spend the last few minutes talking about what we do about conspiracy theories. Don on Twitter writes, I'd like to know how to nip conspiracy theorists in the bud. Can I just say, I don't believe that, and move on? Do I have to engage? Professor Yuzinski, what have you found is the most effective at nipping conspiracy theories in the bud, if they can even be nipped? The best way to nip it in the bud is to have somebody that the, per that the conspiracy theory trusts tell them that it's not true. So there have been a lot of experiments where you take people who believe in death panels, or who believe uh, that President Obama faked his birth certificate. And what we find is when we give them authoritative, correct information, not only does it not change their mind, but it makes them double down on their incorrect beliefs. So the only way to, to really overcome that is to have people on the person's side tell them that they're incorrect. We've been talking about some pretty big conspiracy theories that have effects on on larger issues. You know, the people who President Trump aligns himself with and the guy who showed up at the pizza place how big is this really? Before we end this hour, how much energy do we need to be putting into all of this? Should we be concerned, or is this still a relatively fringe corner of the web? Well, I think what we see is that periodically in American life we get concerned about conspiracies and we have a conspiracy backlash, what's referred to sometimes as a conspiracy panic. Um, so this is not new. There is, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, and I don't necessarily see proof that conspiracy theories are swamping us, that they're overwhelming American life, that they're, you know, disrupting our ability to have normal discourse. I think they are part of normal discourse. I think that they are, I think conspiracy theories are part of the price of having um, free communication uh, combined with a political system where we don't necessarily always feel represented. One thing that I do see that I think is new, I'm at work at, at, on a book about conspiracy theories and I spend a lot of time around conspiracy theorists. Um, I feel like because of the internet, because of social media, the half-life of some conspiracy theories is longer um, and there is more cross-pollination than you would see. The Pizzagate people now believe that Seth Rich is part of the Pizzagate theory. Um, I have this year been at a New Age conference in Los Angeles and a white supremacist rally in Kentucky for book research, and in both places, people were talking to me about Pizzagate. They didn't use that word, but they were talking about pedophiles in the federal government, to the point where now they're pinpointing a number. They're saying 30% of the federal government is made up of pedophiles. Hmm. To the point where now they're pinpointing a number. They're saying 30% of the federal government is made up of pedophiles. That's Anna Merlin, senior reporter for the Gizmodo Special Projects Desk. Anna, thanks you for spending the hour with us. Thank you for having me. University of Miami political science professor Joseph Yuzinski. He's the co-author of American Conspiracy Theories. Thank you, professor. Thank you. And Margaret Sullivan, media columnist for the Washington Post. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Joshua. Great discussion. Remember to send us your stories about being part of the resistance to President Trump, 855-236-1A1A or 1A at WAMU.org. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. Fake news.